Has the extradition law conflict pushed Hong Kong toward a more liberal environment? Today on The Curious Task, I speak with Andrew Work. Welcome to The Curious Task from the Institute for Liberal Studies, where we explore economics, politics, philosophy, and other ideas from a classical liberal perspective. I'm Alex Aragona, your host, and today I'm speaking with Andrew Work. Andrew Work is the CEO of New Work Media, which is the publisher of The Harbour Times. He has run the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong, founded the Lion Rock Institute, and has over 25 years of experience in media, politics, policy, and community engagement. He's in Hong Kong right now, and for the hour, we can consider him our correspondent and someone who will help us make sense of what's going on with the protests in Hong Kong. Andrew, welcome to The Curious Task. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you so much for being with us. So in each episode, we start with a question and go wherever the conversation takes us. Our question is, has the extradition law conflict pushed Hong Kong towards a more liberal environment? But we should probably also spend a good chunk of time exploring the background and context for this question. So if you're ready, we'll get right on that. All right, let's get into it. Why don't you just give us a quick background on Hong Kong itself? I mean, it's it's people know of it, but I think it'd be kind of cool to explore a bit of the history. So it's a former British colony, obviously. Why don't you take us through a bit of that sort of summary? What exactly is Hong Kong? How, how does it stand today? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, I, do a, I do an hour and a half lecture on uh, the economic history of Hong Kong, but I don't think we're going to cover off all that here. <laughs> but Hong Kong was a place that for, for decades uh, benefited from what we call a benign neglect, where... The various administrations that were here, some of them had a deliberate philosophy of leaving well enough alone and letting the local population get on with business. And some of them just couldn't be bothered. Um, either way, both of those resulted in what we call a light touch government that resulted in Hong Kong being an economic dynamo for the last half of the 20th century when Britain, you know, frankly, was was in big trouble. Uh, for those that know their economic history at the end of the 19. Uh, 60s and the 70s, I mean, Britain really took a tumble. They, they literally couldn't, they went from being the empire to couldn't leave the lights on, whereas Hong Kong went from strength to strength uh, right up until the handover in 1997. And since then, uh, it's been a bit of a roller coaster with, you know, kind of macroeconomic factors like the Asian uh, financial crisis kicking off in 19, uh, in the late 1990s was a real blow to the entire region. But then Hong Kong took off again. We had the dot com boom, then we had the dot com bust. Uh, and then after that, things took off again. This, this city does not do recession, really. It's, it's, they, just, they just don't believe in it. It's not built into the DNA. So things took off. Then we had, like Toronto, we had SARS in 2003. That was the worst thing I've seen in my 23 years here. Uh, and then the economy, then things took off again. 2008 was a blip. I mean, it was like we held our breath for a year and waited for something to happen while the rest of the world, you know, the rest of the world in Europe and North America took a big hit. And... It was fine, and Hong Kong carried on. But while all those economic up and downs were happening, there was a, a political tension building that came to a head uh, during the Occupy uh, movement a few years ago, where they were young, mostly young people, though not entirely, took over a large major section of roads in downtown Hong Kong and stayed there for almost three months. And that eventually fizzled out. But the underlying political tensions were still there and they erupted again this year earlier on when the government made a huge misstep uh, in trying to implement a piece of legislation that would have allowed for Hong Kong courts to extradite people to face charges in the Chinese judicial system. So that, that kind of got us to where we are today. So the Occupy movement thing was interesting. I just want to touch on that for a quick second, because a lot of people who are in North America and exposed to mostly American or Canadian media uh, ultimately her looked at it as something that was happening in the United States, maybe a bit in Britain kind of thing. Are those the same people as are now? Or is there kind of like a fusion with other groups now? Like how, how have you kind of traced that? What does that look like? So the, the Occupy Wall Street and then the, the Occupy movement in Hong Kong are really two completely different things. So people sh should not confuse the two. Um, but later on, there came an idea of political protest uh, about the, the development of democracy, whereby people would occupy a small part of Hong Kong. And it was, you know, it was a small group of uh, a professor and a couple of Christian clergymen. And their concept went through some combinations and permutations until finally they were planning a little, you know, it, it was watered down to the point where they were planning a one day sit down in the financial district on a Sunday, which, you know, of course, nobody would have really noticed or cared. 
because that part of Hong Kong is occupied every Sunday by domestic helpers who take over. They literally close the streets so they can just hang out. Um, but what happened instead with Occupy was that there was a student protest at one of the universities and it was so hugely successful that they took it downtown. And then it ended up with them occupying an area around the legislature and then they spilled out onto a major roadway, uh, eight lanes, four in each direction. And they took that over and stayed for months and months and months. Well, that, that's great background. I appreciate you you making that, yeah. that differentiation. So obviously, there's a lot of different groups. And I think there's, these are, there's massive protests going on right now, which we'll get to in a sec. But as I was saying, do you think there's sort of a connection between those those initial ones, the initial activities you were talking about and, and what we're seeing now? Is, is it sort of like, would you, would you say it was kind of like the seeds of certain things were planted with the Hong Kong Occupy stuff a, a little while ago? And, and now that that's sort of sprouting? Or are they kind of different people getting involved now that have, have been in inspired by that, but we're not in fact directly related? Is, is it all kind of like a gray area mess? How, how do you sort that out? Uh, you know, there's, there's, again, this is part of underlying tensions in Hong Kong. And so when Occupy happened, it was a, a protest into China's opposition to the way that people wanted democratic development to go. There was, a, there was an offer on the table from the Chinese government, uh, whereby we would be allowed to elect our chief executive, who is the head honcho, for lack of a better term, for Hong Kong. But it's not really a federal system like you have in Canada. All the power flows from that one person and their power, their, their, you know, their, their appointment and power flows from Beijing. So at that time, people were protesting the fact that the Chinese government was saying, we will let you vote for that person, but we get to pick the candidates. Uh, and the people, okay. deemed that, yeah, the people deemed that unacceptable. Uh, so then the protests went on from it was September 26th to December 15th in 2014. And then... When it was over, there was a real sense of political exhaustion. People were like, uh, you know, we were out there. We occupied the streets for, for, for almost three months straight, and we didn't get what we wanted. You know, we weren't able to affect the change. But the underlying tensions were still there, and like, like a spring, you know, wound up again. Right, okay. And, and then it erupted earlier this year. Now, we, we can get into how, that, how it all kicked off in this round, but – what you have now is, you know, you do have that younger vanguard who were not involved in Occupy because they were too young. And they are now part of the, the most active, uh, most radical vanguard out in the streets of Hong Kong. But when you have a million people march or two million people march, that's a huge swath of society. And so it would, it's fair to say, to summarize that, like, as you said, this isn't like specific issues that maybe people have always cared about. And now they're like, okay, that now it's come up. We're upset. This is like you said, it's a growing public sentiment. There's growing, there's been growing tension for many years between Hong Kong and the mainland China. Yeah. And, you know, I have what I call the bonfire theory of policy and politics, uh, because I was a scout leader with the first Hong Kong Canadian scout group. And, you know, part of the training was learn how to build a bonfire such that you can build it. And then when the kids sit down. You just have to like put a match to it and whoosh, the whole thing goes up, hmm. right? So you're not, you know, it's not like going camping with your buddies where you sit there going, whoosh, 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 you know, for half an hour trying to get a fire going. <laughs> right. But policy, policy is like that too. You can build something in such a way that, you know, you add another piece of wood here, a piece of wood here, a tinder. If you have everything in the right place, when the spark comes, whoosh, it all goes up in a hurry. Uh, you know, and for, for Occupy, that was a student protest. You know, there had been other protests, but there was the idea of an Occupy, and then there were these really successful student protests, and then they took it downtown, right? And then they kind of swarmed over the highway, and boom, it was Occupy, you know, was, was born. This time around, Spark was the chief executive's attempt to introduce a new piece of legislation that would enable the Hong Kong courts to sign off on sending people to China to face trial there, an extradition law. Before we get to the bill itself, I want to do a bit more background on, on Hong Kong itself. Because once again, this is something that we're hearing a lot about right now in, in, uh, in, in the Western media. And I find that people either don't take the time to explain certain nuances of Hong Kong, the political landscape and, and how, like, you know, for instance, the politics are structured there. They, they either just assume people know or they don't think it's important. So I think this is a great opportunity for you to do that. So you mentioned the chief executive of Hong Kong and, and how laws are passed. So before we get to the law itself that sparked all these protests and was sort of uh, helping that, that bonfire grow even bigger, as you were talking about, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Hong Kong political landscape and how it works? So when you look at the political landscape in Hong Kong, it breaks out into different components. Uh, there's a chief executive who has a cabinet. Uh, the cabinet is made up of what we call secretaries, and they would be your usual specialists. So you have a financial secretary, 
uh, secretary for food and health and so on and so on. And then a couple of non-executive members of that, that cabinet uh, called the executive council. So your chief executive is at the top with a group of core advisors called the and ministers called the executive council. Separate from that, we have a legislature, uh, commonly, you know, the shorthand referred to as LegCo for legislative council. The legislative council, it looks like one council with everybody sitting together, but it has a bicameral dimension to it in that the people that sit there, they are elected in two different ways. We have geographical constituencies uh, where people are voted through a complicated but generally fair direct elections and then the other side we have what are called functional constituencies and functional constituencies are a very strange animal you have seats for financial services you would have a seat for transportation uh, but ends up being dominated by for example taxi owners sports and leisure uh, the unions a number of different unions each have their own seats uh, depending on which large constituency they represent. Okay. There are different business organizations that have their own seats. So there's not one seat for business. There's one seat for the textiles industry, right? Which doesn't really exist in Hong Kong as a factory operating industry. It's all the old holdovers from when they came up with the system when Hong Kong still had a textiles industry, but they have a seat. Uh, the major business organizations each have a seat. So the functional constituencies make up half the seats in the legislative council. Some of them have as few as 400 voters. Some of them might have 100,000 voters. So they're wildly unequal in terms of how much bearing each vote has in that council. But the upshot of it is that the functional constituency is designed so that most seats can be returned to pro-Beijing, pro-Communist Party powers. Okay. And then when you add that together with the seats that they're you know, generally able to win on the geographical side, it ensures that the LegCo will always be dominated by pro-China powers. So where the geographical seats tend to be more directly democratic, the range of pro-democratic parties do better. They get more votes, right? But the way in which they're structured uh, ensures that the pro-Beijing parties will always get a certain number of seats. And then on the functional half of the Legislative Council, uh, there are some seats, like, for example, for teachers and accountants and the IT sector, where pro-Democrats have a fighting chance because they have a large voter base. But other sectors are controlled by business and or uh, really small circles so that they will always be controlled by pro-Beijing. And the, the cumulative effect, and this is, this is by design, is that the pro-Beijing forces will have a majority in the legislative council, right? So that's one half of this. That's one part of the system. Uh, the other part is the chief executive at our executive council, which I mentioned earlier. The chief executive is chosen by a council of 1,200 people. And the number of people that are on that council and the way they are chosen ensure that they will always be loyal to Beijing people, which means Beijing effectively chooses the chief executive. Okay. And in the system, the chief executive and her executive council, that's where the power is. Got it. R real quickly, how are those, you mentioned it quickly, but how are those 1,200 people selected? You said the way they're selected. They're a little bit like the mishmash that you have in the functional constituency. So you might have the sports and leisure sector would have a certain number of seats, right? Doctors would have a certain number of seats. Uh, there's four major categories for this, elect for this election committee. Uh, but they're just, again, they're, they're kind of a representative mishmash of different groups that were considered important in Hong Kong society in the mid-1990s, in, in the 1980s and mid-1990s, when the British and the Chinese were negotiating how Hong Kong's post-1997 political structure was going to be. And, you're, and, you, and you mentioned earlier, I just want to touch on it real quick, that you said that at one point there was a discussion about, uh, and I may have misheard, but you said letting the people elect the chief executive? Yes. So how, how did that, how was that proposed and, and, and how, can, you, can you now tie that back to what we're just talking about now? Sure. So part of the, the promise of the handover was that Hong Kong would move towards a more democratic state. And that was left fairly vague. 
and then defined about how Hong Kong would move towards that and at what pace. And so people had expectations, but the expectations were vague. And so it wasn't really clear how those expectations would be met. Over time, the pro-democratic forces, being pro-democracy, they, of course, have been pushing for more democracy in selection of political persons, both at the level of the chief executive and for the legislature. And there's been a lot of toing and froing on that. And that came to a head when we had the suggestion, you know, when the Chinese government came and said, listen, the best you're going to get on the chief executive front where most of the power is, the best you are going to get is the ability to vote for that person. But we are going to screen the candidates. Right. So there will only be candidates that are acceptable to us. And the pro-democracy forces at that time, they rejected that. And the people went to the streets. Right. Resulting in the, resulting in Occupy of 2014. Okay. And, and to tie off the sort of the political landscape section, I just wanted to, to ask you, so, so Hong Kong, I read this in an article and I didn't know this and and I'm assuming other people just don't think of it uh, at the top of their minds too. But so Hong Kong is, can you explain exactly what, like what Hong Kong, Hong Kong is as like a territory right now it's as this whole special administrative region status. And also I read in this one article that, so 2047 is supposedly the year that is supposed to be fully incorporated back into the people's Republic of China. Anyway, yes. I'm wondering if that's relevant to this discussion, if you think I did note it just to, to touch on it, but I'm thinking maybe you could either explain that real quick or, or then at least tell us how it's relevant or not to everything we will be talking about. Sure. So one thing to understand about China is that China is very comfortable with having different rules for different places. Uh, in places, in, you know, for places where you have rule of law, uh, there's a concept that rules should apply equally to everybody everywhere. But if you're in a place that isn't really ruled by rule of law, like China, they're quite comfortable having different rules for different people. And this goes to political jurisdictions as well. So China has provinces, but then it also has the two special administrative regions of Hong Kong and Macau. Uh, there are certain cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Chongqing, Guangzhou that have that exist under a different uh, that exist under a different administrative structure. You could argue that we have the same thing in Canada, where you have provinces and territories that are that are governed differently. But so when they undertook the negotiations for Hong Kong and later Macau, uh, they decided they would call them special administrative regions and they would run under their own rules. In Hong Kong's case, that was meant to last until 2047. And it was done under the framework of something called one country, two systems. And you will hear this term one country, two systems a lot if you follow anything at all about Hong Kong. Because part of the debate was whether or not China is living up to its obligation to respect one country, two systems. And there's a lot of debate about which is more important, one country, two systems. And part of the, the, the tug of war in politics in Hong Kong vis-a-vis -vis China is, you know, China seems to be more favoring one country, whereas people in Hong Kong quite often emphasize two systems. And then there's a pull back and forth about how much of those two things is appropriate and in what dimensions of political life. What's what's the expectation for 2047 then? If we're talking about all all the stuff we're, we have been talking about now and are about to talk about is obviously very important for the people there and the, and the status of, of politics in Hong Kong right now, as you said, with the, the one country, two systems. But if it's going to be fully incorporated back into China in 2047, yeah. what does that mean for everything we will be talking about today, ultimately? Well, uh, the question is, is, is China honoring that part of the agreement to leave Hong Kong be until 2047? And there's a few different ways to look at it. Uh, you know, should that mean that Hong Kong should, should have just remained frozen in time with the kind of political and legal structures that it had in 1997, and then nothing changes until we get to 2047? Well, clearly that's not realistic. So people took that to mean that Hong Kong would have an independent development. It would change its laws. It would advance and modernize independently until 2047. But, of course, a big part of the story is the very real economic and demographic integration of Hong Kong into China. Right? As China opens up and becomes more economically uh, liberal, Hong Kong has taken advantage of it. And that process started back in the, you know, starting in 1976 after Mao died and China started to open up. And if you had one factory in Hong Kong, you could you know, afford to open five in China and expand your business. A lot of people got very rich off that. We're very happy about it. So Hong Kong is already integrating with 
especially, especially with the surrounding area. Uh, it's, you know, traditionally been called the Pearl River Delta. The latest political flavor of the day is calling it the Greater Bay Area, uh, which when they introduced it, everybody thought we were going full San Francisco, but no, it's a local version. So, so, they, so the integration is happening in economics. Uh, it's happening in demographics with people traveling back and forth across the border. And of course, mainland Chinese immigrants moving to Hong Kong. So the question is, is like, how deep is that integration going to be? What parts of life is it going to happen in? Uh, a lot of people in Hong Kong have been pushing back against that integration. When they see integration with China, they don't like what they see. And when they saw something like this proposed amendments to the extradition law, they got really upset about that. They saw that as Chinese judicial system coming into Hong Kong. And that is one of the most fiercely resisted parts of Hong Kong China integration. With regards to the final deadline of 2047, a lot of, you know, a lot of people are thinking that it becomes less important over time because the integration is already well underway. And by the time we get to 2047, it'll be a formality. And are you of that opinion? Yes. There doesn't seem to be anybody out there that is arguing that integration is not already happening. Uh, the only, so, you know, some people have raised interesting points about 2047 and some of the questions it raises. So for example, in Hong Kong, nobody owns land. The government owns all the land. You can lease it on 99 year leases. And people are saying, well, what if the legal system is deemed not to be common law after 2047? What if it then flips over to a Chinese version of Chinese law combined with some elements of civil law? What does that mean for the lease that you have in your building? If you're a young lawyer and you're training right now in 2017, but in 30 years, the common law system will theoretically disappear, does that mean that after 30 years, your career is pretty much done? And how do you feel about, you know, going into a ch University of Hong Kong law school right now when they might throw out the legal system that you've trained and built to practice in 30 years from now? Right. Just as you're hitting your stride in your career. So these are some of the questions raised about what, what might be a, a more dramatic switch that could be flicked in 2047. But by and large... You know the integration is underway. Okay, no, and that's great that you clarify that. The, the 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 that note I had there was based off pretty much once again, and this is why I don't like some of the way the media here writes about the Hong Kong stuff. Is it's, mm. it was sort of based on just a throwaway line. Oh yeah, it's it's going to be re reintegrated into the mainland anyway, and like twenty four seven. Like wait, hold on, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like when I talk with Andrew, I definitely want to clarify exactly what that is about. So I think I think that was awesome that you went through that. If if I can give you one very visible example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there's been a lot of big infrastructure projects that physically connect Hong Kong to the rest of the lower, uh, the Pearl River Delta, AKA Greater Bay Area through transportation links. So we're talking about major bridges now, like you, you might've heard of this massive bridge. I think it's the largest bridge over ocean that connects Hong Kong to Macau and Suhai. Yes, I've read of that, yeah. Yeah, they connected Hong Kong to the national uh, high-speed rail system. So now we have a high-speed rail that takes you right up into Shenzhen and Guangzhou and connect to there at all the high-speed rail across the rest of the country. But there was a huge debate about whether or not Hong Kong uh, law or mainland Chinese law would apply in the train station in Hong Kong. Because the idea was that once you went through the customs control, even though you were physically in Hong Kong, you are now legally in China. And that was a huge debate here. The legislative the pro-democratic people filibustered that and tried to stop it. Uh, but now they see it as this needle of Chinese legal system that penetrates all the way into the heart of Hong Kong, right into the train station. And, you know, there was a, there was a real impact of that. Recently, you might've heard in the news that a local staff member, the British consulate was seized and disappeared into China. For a couple of weeks nobody knew where he was for a while he was seized in the train station under chinese law hmm. so if you're so if you're in that train station and you've, you're on that side of the, the turnstiles you're in china you're not in hong kong anymore that's crazy yeah so it's it's like having you know and, and people in hong kong are afraid of the chinese judicial system coming here and you know that's a prime example of it right there we're almost at the end of the, the first half of the episode, and I, I promise in the second half we're going to talk about the bill and all that. I just I think the background's so important. So last background question: Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong. Yes. I don't. I 
I just keep hearing about her when you either when it's the 90 second reports on the national news or it's once again these throwaway lines or paragraphs um, you know in a news article I just I, I want to get your opinion uh, on you know who she is what she stands for what's really going on you'll read one article that says oh you know this is obviously her way of getting this Beijing stuff going here some people you know they'll take a more neutral approach and say oh you know she's got lots of circumstances and uh, things to balance and think about and of course I've heard a few sort of uh, you know quote man on the street clips from people in Hong Kong I said oh you know she's corrupt that's it so so you tell us what's going on with that I want to know your opinion on Carrie Lam and exactly how we can sort of fit her into the scheme of everything we have been talking about and will be talking about right so just you know this is really the 30 second version but uh, Carrie Lam uh, came from by a large I think what you characterize as, as a humble background uh, joined the Hong Kong government and ro- rose up through the ranks, had a reputation for being tough but fair, uh, very competent. She got things done. A lot of people uh, in Hong Kong had a lot of respect for her and the way that she did business uh, and got things done. But somewhere somewhere along the way, a couple of different things happened. Uh, number one, she part of being tough but fair, unfortunately, meant that she, she also has a reputation for not listening very well. And seems to have lost touch with the people along the way. She was good at getting the confidence of people above her. And when it comes to selection for the chief executive, that means Beijing. And so they were comfortable with her taking over as the chief executive, but she lost touch with the roots that she came from uh, during the brief period where she had to resign from position as chief secretary, the number two position in the Hong Kong government, so she could run in this kind of faux election that we have that I described earlier. There's an incident where she went down into the MTR, which moves five million people into seven million people a day. I mean, everybody uses the MTR. And she goes down into the MTR and gets to the turnstiles and doesn't know what to do. And one of her aides, this is all captured on film, one of her aides quickly produces an octopus card that you use to tap in and go through the turnstile and hands it to her. And she doesn't know what to do with it. And what was meant to be a real moment of the people, you know, I, here I am, a woman of the people, instead became this shocking display of disconnect. Right. So becomes the chief executive. And we have somebody at the top who, tough but fair, gets things done, knows how to crack skulls, knows the bureaucratic system of Hong Kong inside out, but has lost touch completely with the people does not listen well to advisors unless they're coming from above, which at her position, the only thing above is China, and is in the position of of governing Hong Kong. The other problem that we have is for people at the level of chief executive and the executive council, the positions have become so toxic and politically fraught, the only people that will accept them are bureaucrats that have moved up through the ranks. But bureaucrats are not politicians. You know, if you've climbed a political, uh, climbed up the ladder in a political career, you've had to go through the fire. You have made mistakes, very public mistakes. You've been beat up and you have risen again or not, in which case you're not in the game. But you acquire skills uh, that come along with being a successful politician. They are very different from the skills of being a successful bureaucrat. Mm. And the chief executive position is a massively political function. And we are now going on yet, you know, we're, we're having yet another chief executive who has risen up through the bureaucracy to get to the top job, but does not have the, the political skills and the, and the personal touch and the charisma that is needed when things go really wrong. And unfortunately, we're in that situation now. So, I mean, Carrie Lam, very competent administrator, uh, had a spectacular career in the civil service, but she's gone into a position that, that some have called the poison chalice. You know, the, the way it is structured is almost impossible to succeed. And she's there now. So and when we, we're going to talk about the bill in more detail in a sec, as I said before, but just to finish the Carrie Lamb part off before the break here. Um, her in her dealing with the extradition bill. Yeah. How do you sort of sum up what she's doing there? You know, once again, I've, some people have said and this is specific protesters I've quoted like this is pure Beijing sort of uh, corruption into Hong Kong. They basically, you know, they're the ones responsible for they want the bill uh, and then she's completely corrupt now and she doesn't really care or is she, is she trying to balance circumstances? How, how do we sum up her position in all of this as we get into it? OK, I, I will uh, 
before I get into that, I will, I will address one, one last little thing about Carrie Lam is the, the, the concept that she's corrupt. If people mean corruption in a money sense, Carrie Lam has never had any whiff of that in her career. Uh, one of the reasons it's so difficult for non-bureaucrats to step into positions in the executive council and the chief executive position is because they haven't lived under the Hong Kong bureaucratic system of declaring your assets and being monitored your whole career to make sure that you don't have any uh, corruption about you. And that's part of the legacy of, of the British system from 1997 and structures that were set up to support that. So, I mean, there's never been any whiff of corruption about her career. And I just wanted to put that on the table. So moving on to the next part of it, uh, where did the idea for the extradition bill come from? Again, coming back to this idea of a political bonfire, uh, the extradition bill was deliberately left vague when the British negotiated with the Chinese because it was a real sticking point and people in Hong Kong were not ready to accept it at the time of the extradition. It would have made the whole handover project a, no, a non-starter. So they left it vague. They said, listen, we're going to punt this. We're not going to deal with it. But it was always in people's minds. And every once in a while, it comes up as an issue, especially when there's a gangster that's gotten out of China and gotten to Hong Kong. I think Canada has some familiarity with that situation. You know, uh, billionaire gangsters from China, you know, or corrupt officials hiding out in Vancouver for extended period <laughs> of China. Honestly, we know that story. Right. But so, so this, what specifically happened here was a young couple from Hong Kong went on a holiday to Taiwan. Uh, very young, I'd be early 20s. She was pregnant. Uh, the boyfriend comes back to Hong Kong. She doesn't because he has murdered her in Taiwan. So he comes back to Hong Kong. The body is discovered. You know, everybody goes ballistic. And the Hong Kong government pops up and says, well, all we can charge him with is uh, some, money laund some money laundering charges because he emptied her bank account using an ATM card uh, after the fact. But we can't extradite him to Taiwan. So then all of a sudden the Hong Kong government, meaning Carrie Lam and her administration, pop up and say, aha, we know what to do. This is a legal oversight that has been left for too long. Let's introduce amendments to the Fugitive Offenders and Mutual Legal Assistance in Criminal Matters legislation. And so they propose to amend that, uh, this particular ordinance, the uh, Fugitive Offenders Ordinance. So they pop up and say, let's make these changes and then we can extradite them back to Taiwan and this, this horrible, horrible person can stand law. And people were like, oh, that's great. And in the same breath, we're like, wait a second, you want to include China? Oh, I don't think so. Hmm. And that, that kicked off the current controversy. And, you know, it was really immediate where people said, no, this is not on because you can't just throw in China like that because that's a very different animal. And that, that kicked off the whole controversy. Now, there's a couple of different schools of thought about where this comes from. Did Beijing push this? Consensus is building that. Beijing did not specifically come up with this or propose it at this time. It's kind of been, you know, on their priority list, but way down the priority list. So the suggestion was that Carrie Lam thought this was a great idea. Hmm. This is not implausible. Her predecessor in the chief executive position, Xi Lung, he went out of his way to be more China and more Communist Party than the Communist Party. When the Chinese came up with the idea of Belt Road, he showed up with a policy uh, like that we have this phone, phone uh, speech from the throne in Canada. Right. Here we have the policy address. He popped up and he did a policy address that used the word term Belt and Road like 157 times, right? And in China, they were like, oh, we just came up with that yesterday. Thanks for getting on board, I guess. You know, <laughs> a little too keen. A little too keen. Way too keen. You know, he didn't show up the first day of school with an apple. He showed up on the first day of school with like a box of apples and slammed it down on the teacher's desk. <laughs> the whole crate. That's nice. Yeah. So it is not... A it is not unheard of for our chief executives to try and go out of their way to ingratiate themselves from China okay, and yeah. do what they. So, so the, the, the kind of the consensus is building around the idea that Carrie Lam came up with this herself and that China didn't directly provoke this, this whole thing. However, um, there are, you know, there are rumors going around that Carrie Lam's chief predecessor, C. Y. Long, who I just mentioned, the guy with the box full of apples, that he was super keen on this and he was, behind the scenes poking his people and his loyalists to come and put this idea in front of her. Now that's a rumor that's going around now. And frankly, given the nature of conversations, you know, and things that don't get written down, we'll probably never know whether this sprang full form from her head like Athena from the, the mind of Zeus or whether somebody else was 
quietly pushing things along. Um, but you know, she put it out there and all hell broke loose. We may never know, but I, once again, I still think that the background you just gave on all that was, it was very helpful. So, uh, we are going to take a quick break right now and when sure. we get back, we'll jump right back into the bill itself and all, and all that great stuff. So you're on the curious task here and I'm speaking with Andrew work. The Curious Task is a podcast from the Institute for Liberal Studies. Feel free to send us questions and feedback to curioustask at liberalstudies.ca. A special thanks to our supporters on Patreon, including Janet Bufton, Joe Aragona, and Travis Smith. Remember to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Curious Task ILS, and rate us on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you're listening to The Curious Task. Andrew, the, the first half of the episode, I think, was a great background on Hong Kong, what's going on today, uh, the political landscape and all that stuff. And I've been holding you back talking specifically about the extradition bill. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you completely loose. We've done the background. Tell us, what exactly is this extradition bill? What would, and in your opinion, enable? And why are there proponents of it and the opponents of it and what, what they're saying? G- give, us that, give us that whole thing. Let's get into the details. All right. So, uh, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to shoot you down very, very early on in this, uh, you know, this classic move where it's like, oh, good question. Let me ask a different question. But <laughs> so here's the deal. The original was the Fugitive Offenders and Mutual Legal Assistance in Criminal Matters Legislation, uh, Bill 2019. This was introduced to amend the Fugitive Offenders Ordinance. And Hong Kong does, from time to time, already hand over criminals to other jurisdictions. Uh, But it was suggested that under this, but one of the places that it almost never did this was to China. And it certainly wouldn't hand over somebody who is not a uh, citizen of mainland China. It's a little bit complicated, but if you're, if in the past, the Hong Kong government had to, caught mainland Chinese criminals in Hong Kong and just handed them back at the border. And the legal rationale behind that was very vague. What they didn't do was hand over Hong Kong people into China. And so, uh, you know, as we described with the change to this, the idea was that they would be able to do that. So the reason it almost, and I'm going to say almost, not quite, but the reason it almost doesn't matter anymore is because the protests that we have had here, the protesters have come up with five demands. The first one was kill the bill. Uh, and the Hong Kong government came out and they said, oh, we are suspending. You know, first of all, they said a million people hit the streets and the Hong Kong government's come back and says, eh, no, we're going to do it anyways. And then all hell breaks loose on June 12th with the you know, people stop a vote. They shut down the legislature so they can't vote. Then 2 million people come out the next weekend, you know, give or take. It's hard to count at that level, but that's the number in play. 2 million people come out and the Hong Kong government effectively comes out and says, I'm sorry, and I'll try again. And I'll tell you, I've been married for over 20 years. I don't go to my wife and say, honey, I'm sorry, and I'll try again. I say, honey, I'm sorry, and I will never do it again. <laughs> no. After that, the Hong Kong government engaged in a huge amount of sophistry. They came back and said, no, really, we're not working on it anymore. Isn't that good enough? And then the message was, no, it is not good enough. So the bill had gone through two, uh, the bill had gone through a first reading and it would take very little to legislatively reintroduce it and bring it back for a second reading. Part of the reason the Hong Kong government thought it was good enough to say that they had suspended work on the bill was because in 2003, there was another piece of legislation they were trying to change. And I, I don't want to get too much into that, but the people protested and the government suspended work on the bill and they just let it sit there until the legislative session expired and the, the legislation died on the books. And that was good enough back then. Although people were angry, they didn't want the government to do what they were doing. There was some trust in the government. Now there is zero trust. And so when the government said, we're going to do the same thing we did in 2003, people were like, not good enough. You must completely withdraw this. And the government popped up again and said, well, you know, as protests are going on and intensifying, the government comes back and says, well, no, really, we've killed the bill. And people are like, that, those words have no meaning. We want a formal withdrawal. We want this off the legislative books so that it would take a much, you have a much higher legislative hurdle to reintroduce it. Right. 
We don't we don't want to do that Canadian thing where we just ushered in in an omnibus bill or something a few <laughs> a little while later, right? Exactly. Exactly. People just aren't going to buy that anymore. And so the protests went on and they intensified and they took on new forms and the airports were hit until finally uh, the government came and said, "Okay, when legislature resumes in October, we will formally withdraw." So now at this point the protesters have five demands. And one of, there is a promise to enact one of their five. They haven't done it because technically they can't until the legislature resumes and people think they might renege. Hmm. So, so the, the protesters got one of their five and it is the one specifically related to this bill. However, you know, if they had a, withdrawn it right away at the beginning, instead of saying, no, we're going to do it. Well, we're sorry, but we're going to try again later. And then tried to fudge it. If they had have just completely withdrawn at the beginning, we would, there's no way that we would be where we are now. Right. Right. Where the protests have intensified, clashes with police uh, have resulted in another demand, which is a demand for an independent inquiry uh, into Hong Kong police actions. Uh, there is now they're also demanding the, they want Carrie Lam to resign and other related uh, members of the cabinet, so the Secretary for Justice and the Secretary for Security. They are looking for, let's see, that's three. Uh, they're looking for more democracy, and they're looking for a pseudo-amnesty release of people that have been related in the protests. So that's, you know, by now it's gotten to a pretty long list. If they had have had full withdrawal of the bill at the beginning, the other four probably would, wouldn't be on the table. The underlying tensions would still be there, but enough pressure would have been relieved for things to maybe. I mean, now we're talking about how many angels dance on the head of a pin, what may have been. Right, right. Right, but this is, there, there's, there's, a, there's a, you know, a consensus or an idea that if they had withdrawn the bill right away, we wouldn't have what we have now in terms of intensifying protests, intensifying violence, clashes with the police, a police force that has completely lost its reputation with a huge swath of society that, you know, are astounded and, and dismayed at what they've seen. Um, so, and these, now we have these five demands that the hardcore protesters are saying, we need all five or nothing. And, and, and one of my next questions is going to be, and I think you just, you touched on it though, is, uh, we're talking about if, if all this conflict has ultimately pushed Hong Kong towards a more liberal environment and sentiment anyway. And as you said, if it, if the, government had just said, okay, forget it. We're, we're, we're getting, we're taking this bill off the table. Um, it, the other demands may not have come up. So, so do you ultimately feel that reg regardless of how all that happened, where we're at today, as we record this in mid September is that there is an increasing appetite for even more liberalization of, of the way, uh, people even think about all this stuff. Yeah. I don't think there has ever been an acceptance of a creeping main, they call it mainlandization. I, I have my own term that I use. I call it getting jacked. Hong Kong is getting jacked by China. Well, all, all caps, J-A-C-C, -C, just another Chinese city. Got it. Okay. Right. I'm, I'm, turning, I'm turning this acronym. Help, help me spread this one. I'm turning this acronym into a, a noun and a verb. Perfect. I like it. So Hong Kong is getting capital J, capital A, capital C, capital C, jacked by China, being turned into just another Chinese city. There's never been an acceptance of that in Hong Kong. Uh, people thought and by people people i mean especially older generations they you know they they for them the opening of china was a huge opportunity uh they made spectacular amounts of money off it and it was a wonderful thing for them but for the next generation they look north and they see a, a hyper competitive workforce uh, mainland chinese work you know just as hard if not harder than local hong kongers they have connections they understand the legal system they know how to work local guanxi they speak the local dialects you know other than mandarin whether it's shanghainese or uh Fukien, depending on what province you're in uh, they know how to work the corruption which hong kongers do not and so when they go you know when the hong kongers go north of the borders they find their languages is as good they don't have the they don't have the connections they don't know how to negotiate a corrupt environment right and you know even things like air pollution and lack of access to a free internet they do not want those things to come to hong kong um, so, you know, while the period of the 1970s and 80s and 90s, people were like, yay, China, we're all making money. The people that have not grown up in that environment, the next generation that came up, they just see China as dirty and corrupt and competitive and, 
not good for them. Right. And when they see that coming to Hong Kong, they push back. I guess another way to ask my question is that since there is it possible that before, as you said, with, with the initial demand that the bill simply be removed, um, that this is, as you said, sort of holding things back, almost taking sort of a, a defensive approach to this whole thing. But now that, as you said, there's been more police brutality and the police have lost their re- reputation and, and decent standing in the community and that there's even th- there are so many more things going on right now. And as you said, the whole like, sorry, but we'll try it again kind of thing. After all that, are people now less maybe defensive as I'm terming it and more like offensive now with what they want to see happen. Like, is this, has this woken up even, even more people like to, th- to thinking that this is not, um, you know, simply an issue of the day we have to worry about. But as you said, they, they tied even more to the underlying tensions that you've been mentioning, like that this is, this is even, this is even a worse sign of things that could come if we let more influence like this uh, in, in our judicial processes and in our legal processes. Yeah, um, the judiciary is interesting because that is one institution that has remained independent and people still very much respect it. Hmm. There's a little bit of, you know, of course, people are going to grumble if they think, you know, if, uh, they they don't like a decision that was made by the courts. Uh, you know, if some pro-China people think that a protester didn't get a harsh enough sentence, there's going to be some grumbling. Or if some pro-democracy people thought that a protester got too harsh a sentence, there's going to be some grumbling. But by and large, the judiciary has maintained its reputation for independence, right? The police used to have that position. Uh, I can probably dig out an article that I wrote after the WTO ministerial meetings here where there were, there was imported uh, protesters that were tear gassed, uh, especially the Koreans came in. They're, they're, the, they're the master rioters. I mean, they really, especially at that time, they perfected it to an art form. Um, and I wrote, I, you know, I remember writing pieces about how well the Hong Kong police handled the situation and, and what a boon they were for rule of law in Hong Kong. But that reputation has really, really been shattered here. And with the five demands, one of them, you know, two of them relate to the clashes with the police, an amnesty for arrested protesters uh, and a commission of inquiry, mostly focused around police brutality. I mean, that's, that's, that's not a good look for the defenders of rule of law. Then I guess where do you where do you see this all actually going in the long run? Then, uh, like you know, we can talk about the the protesters and their demands, and, and you've taken us through a lot of the information and exactly what, what's happening today as we record this. It's it's mid September, but what what's going to happen? Do you think there will be a long term effect on the the chief executive and uh, and people in those positions? Will they look at all of this and and say, "Wow, we're certainly not trying that again. We should listen." Or is it more like, "Hey, if we want to try that again, we should probably go about it a different way." Well, will the powers that be still try to push forward th- these kinds of agendas? Where, where do you, where do you see it actually going? Oof, this is a very complex situation. I get I get asked like, "Where do you see this going?" or "How do you see this ending?" every day. So a couple of things. Uh, we had the lesson of Occupy. And when, and, and when I said you know, earlier that the generation that was part of Occupy, now they're, they're older, they have jobs, they're starting to get married, and they were providing advice and funding for the current generation of the front, what we call the frontline protesters, really hardcore that are out there mixing it up with the police. The, the, one, of the, one of the lessons from that was like, don't stick around, you know, protest go back to your schools, go back to your day jobs, and then come back another day. Don't, don't occupy like we did. We just could not keep it up. And we ran out of steam and you know, there was this huge sense of futility after. Um, so I think that protesters by you know, showing up on a Saturday and a, or a Sunday and then maybe a Wednesday night when nobody expects it, or they've got longer staying power, right? When people say, oh, Occupy ran from September to December. Yeah, they were there every day, all the time. Whereas here, people kind of go away back to their regular lives and then they show up again. So this could go on for a very, very, very long time. Hmm. The, in terms of government, you know, getting to the underlying issues of the people, in Hong Kong society, there's been a lot of people in Hong Kong talking about the, the economic pressures, about the fact that young people have no, you know, either very little hope or no hope of ever owning their own property and being able to move out and have an independent life. Um, you know, the best they can hope for is to get a flat in public housing someday, maybe if they're lucky. Uh, and so in Hong Kong, we've been having a discussion about all those underlying economic factors. But the people, th- there's a huge sense that if the ho- people of Hong Kong had genuine democratic control of their political structures, 
they could resolve those issues in their own way. They could find, they could negotiate with each other through a genuinely democratic system to find solutions that were acceptable to the broader population. But they don't have that. And so when they take to the streets about a political issue, there's always this idea that's like, if we actually ran our own show, we would be able to resolve this amongst ourselves, right? That's the value of a democratic system. It's not in delivering a perfect world. It's in resolving the differences in, in opinion that we all have with each other in such a way that we accept it and move on until the next right. election. Right. So, so there's this real sense that if we did have control of our democratic future, we would be able to resolve all these other issues in society. Um, so people fight for that. The problem is that you know, the Hong Kong government comes back and says, OK, uh, we're going to listen. Really, we're going to set up this organization and it's going to have all the high and mighty on it. And this time we're going to listen to you. But people have no faith in that because they believe the elites are completely out of touch uh, with the people, starting with the chief executive, who, as I explained, is kind of a poster girl for being out of touch with the Hong Kong people. Uh, you know, and then you've got septuagenarians and octogenarians who a lot of them came from humble backgrounds, but, you know, they don't understand modern aspirations. You know, maybe 40, 50 years ago, they ascended into a, another level that you know, 95% of the Hong Kong population will never have contact with. You know, they're kind of, you know, the classic uh, science fiction trope from the movie Metropolis, where the elites are living up in the clouds. Mm, right. Um, so the government is trying to show they're listening after years of not listening. and nobody's really buying it right you know, the, the, protest, the protesters have a promise to, to deliver one of their five demands a promise to deliver one of them they haven't actually got it and so they're going to carry on uh the one question that we have every couple of weeks there's a question as to whether or not the masses are behind the hardcore protesters that are out there throwing uh molotov cocktails you know british influence they call them petrol bombs here do those people, do those hardcore people that are blocking the streets, do they have the, do they still have the support of a wider swath of the Hong Kong population? And then there's another rally where they say, listen, this is going to be a peaceful rally. And still tens of thousands of people come out. Now, that's not the million or the two million that we had in June. And the concern, the concern is that increasing levels of violence and the police, you know, blasting water cannons and all that, then of course that deters people. You, you know, grandma's not coming out anymore. She thinks she's going to get hammered by a water can. <laughs> right. That's not a good place for grandma to go at that point. Yeah. And, but the unpredictability of the current protests, you do see some weird things happen. And you'll see some of the footage that I took on our, on our Facebook page where, uh, you know, the, there's a, a protester in the full black with the masks and the goggles and the, and the helmet. And he's, you know, hammering away on an MTR sign that the, the MTR, our, our mass rapid uh, mass transit system here has been seen as a line of police. So it has become a target for the protesters. And this guy's hammering away on one of the signs. He does a pretty good job of destroying it in short order. And then on the other, you know, right next to that, there's an escalator coming up and there's another big protester all clad in black with the helmet and everything on. And he is gently escorting this elderly gentleman with mobility issues he is bringing him up to the top of the escalator, helping him out, you know, almost encasing him and gently helping him off to the side, out of the way of all the action. Um, you know, you just see some really weird juxtapositions like that, right? Where property is being attacked, but people are being you know, gently ushered off to the side. Um, but the question is, are the people still behind these protests? And right. every few weeks they have one where they say, listen, no crazy stuff. You know, the, the organizations that are, that are organizing these things are like, guys, peaceful protest. We got to have a day off. And the people still come out. You know, we haven't had another million or two million person march, but we have had hundreds of thousands. And so you look at that and I mean, frankly, I look at it and I'm like, really, are people still backing them? They've got the promise of the withdrawal. And you look and it's like, yep, yes, they do. The people are still coming out. So I think that's the thing that people need to watch for hmm. is when they declare a peaceful protest. A, does the government allow it to happen? And B, do the people still come out? I mean, if the government, if the government, one thing that has happened that Bear is explaining, in Hong Kong, there's a system whereby if you want to have a protest, I think it's over 30 people, you have to obtain 
what is called a letter of no objection from the police. And this was routine for decades, right? And Hong Kong was famous for peaceful protests, lots of people, but peaceful protests. But the, the police have stopped issuing those letters. Hmm. Now they're like, every time somebody wants to do a rally or a walk or a march, you know, the police are like, no, we know how this ends. You guys are all going crazy. Uh, and breaking things and, you know, all the crazy stuff that you're seeing in the news. And so essentially every protest now is illegal. So if people come out, you know, they're, they're running the gauntlet of being arrested, which is not going to happen for the vast majority. You know, typically arrest is reserved for those who are willing to mix it up and take it to the, the more extreme level. Right. But, but it does have a chilling effect. And it goes to our broader question of, you know, is Hong Kong becoming more or less liberal? Over the last couple of weeks, police have just been saying, nope, no, nope, no, nope. all protests are illegal. They want to put a lid on this. Uh, and that's not good. So, so the question is, will people come out even though they know they're in an illegal rally now? And so far they have been. Right. And I think th- this goes back to what you're referring to as the un- the underlying tensions, right? Is that even though the the established authority is uh, is n- does hasn't budged yet, once in, in in terms of all the things you were just discussing, you still have people that um, aren't giving up on the, on that overall sentiment of uh, you know this isn't right, right? It's not just about a bill yeah. anymore. It's it's just there's there's a something's rotten in the state of Hong Kong kind of thing, right? Like it's it's a broader thing going on, and I think that that that's a good thing. It sounds by the way you're describing it is that once again people aren't saying, oh, you're gonna you know, talking about getting rid of the bill. Okay, great, I'm done. You know that's not what's happening. So that's that's pretty good, I guess. That's not. That's not what happened. Over. I mean, the, the situation with the police is really, really deteriorated. And so this, this demand for commission of inquiry and a lot of the Hong Kong elites, including the Hong Kong General Chamber of Commerce, have come out and said, yes, let's have a genuinely independent inquiry. And the Hong Kong government's come back and says, oh, no, we have the we have the uh, IPCC, the uh, Internal Police Complaints Council, uh, all appointed by the chief executive. It has no power to compel witnesses. It has no power to issue subpoenas. It's They've tried to beef it up with some international representation, including one guy from Canada who is apparently under some kind of a cloud because of some kind of a scandal. Uh, and the, so, you know, but this is not good enough. I mean, people are saying this thing is not, it, it's called the Independent Police Complaints Council, but it is internal to the police um, and it lacks power. So people are saying not independent enough. And a lot of, former government senior executives, people that were in the cabinet, the executive council, uh, people at the highest levels of business have come out and said, yes, let's have a genuinely independent council. Uh, So that's been a real problem that that hasn't happened and that will continue to be one of the core demands for the, for the protesters until they get something that that, that resembles that. Right. Uh, a lot, a lot of people are, you know, then you've got kind of the other side, the pro China side, the pro Beijing side, and they're saying, oh, good. Yes, let's have it. Uh, but let's also include protester activity and actions and things that they have done as well as part of a, a broader commission. So it's not just police brutality, but it's about the whole protests and who did what. Right. There's a lot of variation about like, should we have one where we investigate what happened, but we don't name names, or maybe we have an amnesty, or maybe we have an amnesty for the light, you know, kind of the not so serious stuff, but we still prosecute the more serious stuff. And that those are all in debate. I guess it's no surprise that the bureaucracy and established authority wants to set up a uh, an investigation that, that really works for them. <laughs> yes, and I guess that's normal everywhere. But the difference is that in a genuinely democratic society, you couldn't get away with it. Whereas here, they keep pushing it, keep pushing it. And you can't tell if their childlike surprise at the fact that people don't accept this is genuine or if they are, you know, they're, or they're, you know, they're, they have communist masters in Beijing and they're like, well, go and propose this. And they're like, well, we know this isn't going to work, but the guys in Beijing said, this is the best we can do. So we'll put it out there, knowing full well that it is not good enough. Right. Oh, and or if they're just doing it for window dressing for the international community. But I mean, nobody's buying it. No, no diplomat here buys that the IPCC is genuinely independent. And you mentioned you, you mentioned the international community really right. quick, and I just wanted to touch on one note I had here, which is what, what you think the international community's role should be. Obviously, opinions on this range, at least the, the ones I've been hearing in Canada and the ones of the United States, 
in our media, you know, opinions range from, you know, diplomatic support, you know, moral support, that kind of stuff to some people, of course, are, are ready to, to start the good old intervention word, right? Like, let's like intervene somehow in this kind of stuff. Like, what do you think um, in terms of bettering the situation, the proper role for the international community is as, as they observe all this stuff? With regard to international engagement, what is happening in Hong Kong, uh, the the traditional thing has been for diplomats in Hong Kong to look at what's happening when everything was quiet. They say, Oh, one country, two systems. That's working really well. We continue <laughs> to support it. Everything's fine. When something happens. So for example, when five booksellers were kidnapped, you know, three out of Hong Kong, one out of Thailand, one of the mainland, then they would say, Oh, we have concerns about one country, two systems, but generally everything's working well. Uh, that, Pro, that manner of behavior, that standard practice has been sorely tested. Now, among different groups, there's a lot of different opinions about what is the proper role of international bodies. So among the protesters, some of them have the opinion, this is Hong Kong only. Let's face it. Nobody's coming to our rescue. We've got to deal with this ourselves. Other Hong Kong groups, including pro-democratic politicians, have been traveling the world trying to get support, whether it's from European legislators, American legislators, Canadian legislators, they, you know, they've gone on tour and some of them are on tour as we do this recording. Uh, we've had marches. We had a whole march that was targeted at getting the United States to pass legislation to punish those in Hong Kong that have been deemed to suppress human rights. And, you know, you see some people that say, why are you guys out there flying American flags? They're not going to help us. And you kind of look like traitors to China, whereas other people are like, no, we need the international community to support us. So there's a, there's a lot of conflict within the protesters and pro-democratic camps about whether or not inviting uh, international support is appropriate, right? But then you have just people. So for example, on the Harbor Times Facebook page, we just put up a video of people in Markham, Ontario, singing the new Hong Kong national anthem that's been composed. Uh, there are people all around the world that are choosing to go out and demonstrate on behalf of Hong Kong. They're being met by pro-China protesters, but there's people at the population level that want to support the protesters and mainland Chinese around the world that are trying to run counter to that. So, you know, frankly, you know, my sense is that nobody can really do anything substantial uh, to change China's course outside of moral support. And, and that's important. I mean, that does inspire people. It causes them to carry on in their fight. But nobody's, you know, no, nobody's sitting in the tanks. Uh, the Hong Kongers are going to have to fight this one on their own. Ult ultimately, back to the internal politics, I guess. D sure. You, so do you, do you ultimately feel that re regardless of how this all all ends up, that this sort of does indeed send a message to whether it be the Hong Kong chief executive and, and, and that aspect of the government or, or even mainland China and pro Beijing ties and things like that. Do, do you think that this does send a strong signal that makes them sort of think twice uh, before they actually try and, uh, you know, either exert their influence or, or, or pass something, uh, push something through that the population largely disagrees with? Or once again, do you ultimately think that this is in the long run going to ultimately be an issue about a bill that they can move on from? So, so the question is, what message are the powers that be, meaning primarily Beijing, who right now it seems like they are giving instructions to the chief executive in Hong Kong. Like somebody who's built a reputation on competency seems to have completely lost her way. And there seems to be a consensus now that Beijing is calling all the shots. The protesters aren't, don't even seem to be targeting Carrie Lam that much anymore because they realize that she's not the one pulling the strings. If it's the people in Beijing, what message are they taking from all this? Uh, in 2003, I mentioned earlier that there were protests against another unpopular piece of legislation that would, have, that would have been perceived to have put more controls on Hong Kong society. People fought back against that to, to defend a more liberal society in Hong Kong. Um, there may be a quiet period. There does tend to be a sense that after something like this happens, that you kind of have to lay low for a while. The problem that we have is that the people that are pulling the strings do not understand the mindset of a free people. And 
they have it in their heads that anybody that is pro-democracy must be working with foreign forces and therefore is some kind of a traitor. So they will not countenance discussion with them. Hmm, OK, OK. In the decade following the handover, there was a lot more dialogue between the pro-democratic and pro-China camps. And they could actually talk to each other. And that seems to have just disappeared over the last 10 years. And that's been a real problem. And so, you know, China come back and they say, well, they, they will they will almost certainly come away from this, you know, whenever this passes and whatever happens, happens. And if there is a quiet period after, they will come away from this. And almost inevitably, their answer will be more money, more control. And, you know, kind of the big long term picture in a, in a position that I've held is that the Chinese government's ultimate aim vis-a-vis Hong Kong is to create something like Singapore, where it is politically stable. Nobody steps out of line. It is economically vibrant. It is bright and shiny. People are pretty happy with the government they have because they are delivering the, the material goods. But Hong Kong is not like that. Hong Kong has a different history. Uh, the people are used to a much broader range of political and economic freedoms, in particular political freedoms. And they don't like what they see on the mainland. When there was a sense that China was liberalizing, they could, they could handle a certain degree of integration. But now that they see China regressing, and becoming more oppressive and things that have happened here in Hong Kong uh, that have suggested that that could come to Hong Kong, they're pushing back. And so what message will Beijing take? Probably they'll make up their own conclusion, which will be more money and more control. And that is exactly the wrong message to take back. But I don't think it is in their nature to do otherwise. It is, it is the nature of a communist and authoritarian society. More control is always the answer. Right. Cl- clamp down harder. Maybe we'll finally get the clamp locked for once. That's the idea, right? In, in terms of the 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 narrative that the public can fashion around everything that's going on, um, in, specifically I'm talking about free speech and freedom of the press now. We, we did talk about that briefly together at a break. Um, so what does that look like now? And in reaction to all this, are, is there is there a clamp down on it? Or is there are we seeing more... Of free press like flourishing in a certain way like how how's that landscape look right now i don't think i've read anything about that uh, from our from our media over here about specifically what the people can do to you know push forward the public discussion the way they want okay so the uh, so earlier on i talked a little bit about freedom of assembly and the fact that you have to get a letter of no objection and in the past they were always issued mostly no questions asked for huge rallies and marches and now re- just recently uh, the police have stopped issuing those, making every protest essentially an illegal one. So that's one issue. Then we have freedom of the press. The fact that you know about this is because freedom of the press is still very vibrant in Hong Kong. Uh, foreign media have not been den- denied visas to come here. They're all over Hong Kong. Um, and I know the Canadian media has, you know, I've, I've had a lot of interaction with them. And they're, you know, the, the National is doing nightly news and global TVs. Jeff Semple is over here. And Nathan Vander for Global Mail is down here. The foreign media is definitely on the ground. Uh, the local media is vibrant, ranging everything from independent websites to the traditional media to student journalists. However, there has been a lot of concern because um, a lot of the media, you know, th- there are incidences where the media are not allowed to film something or they are kept out of a certain area wondering what's going on, almost usually because protesters are being, uh, are being apprehended and the police don't want to bear scrutiny as to how they are doing that. Uh, there have been incidences of people believe uh, journalists being targeted with tear gas being thrown at them to get them to back off from viewing things, uh, being shot with rubber bullets and beanbag rounds. And the Hong Kong Journalists Association, the Foreign Correspondents Club, have issued very strong statements about this. So, I mean, the people are out there, and it's being everything's being reported on all the time. So. By and large, it is still free, but there are concerns that violence is being used against journalists, and in, in, in it is slowly ratcheting up as the police feel more defensive and feel like they can get away with more. We have a separate issue with non-police actors uh, from the triads, essentially gangsters, uh, that are getting a light touch from police. And so they are very hostile to the media. Uh, But they seem to feel like they can get away with being filmed, attacking people and not really worrying too much about being arrested. And so this is another concern. So the press is out there. 
people are saying whatever they want. Uh, no publications have been shut down or told to shut down or editors being arrested. Nothing like that has happened. But there's concern about violence at the street level being directed at journalists. And so that's one to watch out for. So we've talked about a lot, but we want to give you the chance to summarize everything if we can. We had like a big discussion. I know it's a tough job and I'm giving I'm giving you the toughest one. Uh, what do you ultimately hope are the main takeaways for someone listening to you here today on whether or not everything we've talked about, all the conflicts in Hong Kong, will push it towards a more liberal environment? You know, the people of Hong Kong are very creative and they are very persistent and they are very committed to the freedoms that they enjoy and they are plugged into the modern world and they have an evolving sense of what those freedoms are and what they should be in the future. They have not lacked for exercise in that creativity and persistence in getting the message across to their government. I really hope that the authoritarian instinct does not push things to a level where conflict becomes completely unmanageable. Uh, you know, I, I still have faith in the people of Hong Kong to get the message across and negotiate an acceptable outcome uh, that enables Hong Kong to grow and thrive in a more liberal environment. I am very, very cautiously optimistic. Uh, you know, when you see the conflict now, it's that optimism can be hard to hold on to. But there's a lot of people here that believe in this city, and we're holding on to that optimism uh, that that a resolution can be found that will see a more liberal and prosperous Hong Kong, not a less liberal and less prosperous Hong Kong in the future. I think that's a great place to end it if there ever was one. So, Andrew, thank you so much for joining me today on The Curious Task and chatting about all that. My pleasure. This episode of The Curious Task was produced by Alex Aragona and Sabine L. Chidiak. Our executive producer is Matt Bufton. The music you heard on today's episode was created by Lindy Voppenfjord. You should check out his other stuff online. The Curious Task exists today because of donations of time and money from those creating it and listeners like yourself. Check us out on Patreon and find out how you can support us and get access to exclusive offers. I'm Alex Aragona. Thank you very much for joining us on The Curious Task. Don't tell me that was still too fast.